Well, this morning, as we turn together to God's Word, we're returning to and continuing our series, walking through uh, some of Jesus' teaching, actually quite a bit of Jesus' teaching, in the form of parables. And I've been calling this series, Taking a Closer Look, Jesus' Parables Contain Some Unexpected Lessons and Even Warnings for the Faithful. And keep in mind uh, that parables are stories taken from the realm of everyday life that communicate spiritual truth. And Jesus regularly taught in parables using widely familiar pictures, well-known pictures uh, coming from the, the realm of familiar life, everyday life, if you will. And Jesus used them as springboards or jumping off points to teach spiritual truth. And throughout this series, we've often found ourselves confronted by shocking and unexpected twists in the storylines of a number of Jesus' parables. Often when we least expect it, we suddenly see our reflection in the mirror of the parable in a much less than flattering way. And suddenly we find ourselves compelled to see truths that we'd prefer, quite honestly, in our flesh to look away from. We find Uh, that ourselves unable to continue to ignore realities about ourselves that we find uncomfortable to consider. And parables have a way of compelling us to consider what we find uncomfortable. Uh, they, They compel us to see what we would prefer to look away from sometimes. Jesus' parables contain unexpected lessons and even warnings for the faithful. And uh, this morning we're turning to what is known as the parable of the great banquet. And it's also been appropriately titled for reasons that will become very clear in just a moment, the parable of the excuses. Uh, Both titles are fitting descriptions of the parable. And with that in mind, we're going to be turning to Luke 14. I'd encourage you to turn there in your Bible if you'd like to. Luke 14, verses 12 to 24. And remember that this has been titled the parable of the excuses, which uh, leads us to consider the danger of making excuses uh, and causes us to ask questions about where am I making excuses. So as I read, listen for a couple of key words that are repeated throughout this parable. Uh, The idea of a banquet or a feast, depending on your translation, banquet, and then excuses. Again, this is Luke 14, beginning at verse 12. He, also, um, he said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just." When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the, t- uh, and at the time for the banquet, he sent out his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all like began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and I cannot come, uh, and therefore I cannot come. Uh, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and there is still room. And the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Uh, So the parable focuses on a great banquet and on the excuses people used to back out on attending it. And let's pause and consider the background here a little bit, because some of us are probably wondering, why is Jesus talking about a banquet? And the answer is found by looking at all of Luke chapter 14 quickly up to this point. Uh, 
And the chapter, of course, begins with Jesus eating with a group of people in the home of a prominent Pharisee. The first verse of chapter 14. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So Jesus was being closely, or you might say carefully, watched, and not surprisingly, he started to teach. And picking up on the topic of humility, he said this in verses 8 and 9. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, there's again that feast theme, that banquet theme. When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor. Lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give up your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Can you picture what the reality is here? Don't put yourself in the highest position because what happens if you get asked to go uh, to a a lower position? And then uh, continuing in verse 10, it says this, But when you are invited, go sit in the lowest place uh, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who are at table with you. Now, of course, it's not the main point of what we're going to unpack this morning, but what Jesus just said here in Luke chapter 14 very closely echoes Proverbs 25, verses 6 and 7, which says this, Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. I think we can picture what Jesus is saying. Now, with that in mind, kind of imagine the discussion around the table a little bit. And the subject of wedding banquets, celebrations, and just banqueting generally uh, was the subject of conversation around the table. And that brings us to verses 12 to 14 and to our passage for today. And in these verses, Jesus challenges What our default thinking normally is, essentially saying, my paraphrase, don't invite people who will repay you. Uh, Verses 13 and 14 in the New Living Translation capture it this way. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. And so here we see... Uh, a theme that runs throughout Luke and runs throughout all of God's Word, but God's care uh, for the poor, the outcast, and the overlooked. And here we probably see our own reflection in the mirror, and we're forced to ask the question, uh, am I falling into the dangerous trap of self-serving, invita- uh, you know, self-serving invitations? Saying, if I invite this person, what can I get back from that? I mean, isn't that how we normally think? Isn't that the default pattern? that we naturally fall into. And Jesus is saying, no, invite those who cannot repay you, and you will be rewarded at the resurrection when Jesus returns. If, however, you invite those who can repay you today, and they reward you, you've had your reward. That's it. And that brings us to verse 15. And one of those who reclined at the table with Jesus says this. Now, keep in mind the subject that they were just discussing, and keep in mind what Jesus had just said, and you can probably imagine him starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So he says, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And again, this is probably best understood as a way of changing the subject because the line of conversation was starting to go to an uncomfortable place. After all, Jesus had uh, had just been saying to the man who invited him, in verse 12, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite uh, invite you in return and you be repaid. So can you imagine him starting to feel a little warm? Can you imagine that there's a little sweat starting to break out on his brow. He's starting to turn a little bit red. Because this is they're at such a banquet, right? And what did Jesus just say? And, of course, the subject was banquets in general. So he tries to change the subject, saying, of course, 
Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And we can quickly see when we stop and think about it why this man would want to move the conversation along and away from what was starting to feel quite uncomfortable. And he says, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And this, of course, what he says is incalculably and really indescribably gloriously true. And in response, Jesus launches into the parable itself. It's found in verses 16 to 24. We might say that Jesus seizes the opportunity. It's like saying, well, now that you mention that subject, and from there he launches into a very important lesson. But here's the catch. The host who made this statement no doubt assumed that he and everyone around the table was automatically going to be at this glorious future banquet celebrating the coming of the kingdom of God. And that said, Jesus is very clear that attendance at this glorious future banquet is anything but automatic. And this is a jarring truth. Keep it in mind because we'll need to come back to it throughout the parable. Now, to understand the details of what happens here, we need to understand the two-stage invitation custom that was very common at the time. Customarily, there were two invitations essentially issued for a banquet. The first would say, would ask if you are coming, and then the second would announce that it's time to come because the celebrations are ready to begin and the food is prepared and ready to be consumed and enjoyed. So those making excuses had no doubt already agreed to come and the second invitation was going out saying, come now. And they were going back on their commitment and making all kinds of excuses. And so there is good reason that this has been termed the parable of the excuses as well as the parable of the great banquet. Both are very appropriate titles and the first excuse comes from someone who just bought a field and he says in verse 18 I have bought a field and I must go out and see it please have me excused and the second excuse is similar he explains that he's just purchased five yoke of oxen that's ten oxen and he's on this way to try them out so he asks to be excused as well now think about it um Some here think that the excuses are likely at least partially dishonest, though there is some debate about that point. But the line of thinking goes something like this, and I I think there's a lot to be said for this. Who buys a field without first looking at it? And, And who purchases 10 oxen without inspecting the animals? And when you put it that way, you can kind of see the context of these excuses. These excuses seem to be lame attempts to get out of their commitments. And remember, because of the two-stage custom, that they almost certainly already had agreed to come, and now they were backing out on a previous commitment. You say, is there a biblical example of this custom of two-stage invitation uh, to a banquet? Let me give you one example. It's found in the book of Esther. Uh, Esther chapters 5 and 6, to be very specific. In Esther Esther chapter 5, Esther invites the king and Haman to a banquet and says, come to the banquet. And then if you continue reading the book of Esther, you know, an incredible account of courage and all of that, but as you read the book of Esther, you'll notice in the next chapter, in chapter 6, that then it becomes time for the banquet and the servants go out and get Haman and say, the banquet is ready, come right now. You see this custom. First you ask, will you come? And then this uh, sending a servant out essentially to to bring everybody, to to bring in those who are invited, to, to summon them to come, if you will. Well, anyway, in verse 20, we come to another excuse. We're still not done with the excuses. And this man says, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. And at least at first glance, uh, this feels a little bit better than the first couple of excuses because after all, in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 5, uh, it says this, when a man is newly married, he shall not uh, go out with the army or be liable for any any other public duty. He shall be free at home for one one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. 
And that said, attending a banquet is not going off to war. And he'd previously agreed to come. So it's an excuse. Now, some have pointed out that it is highly likely, and I am not saying this is a good thing, it was a bad thing, but I'm speaking about the customs of the day, that it's highly likely that women were not invited to the banquet, generally, and this man's young new wife specifically. That is probably true, and some commentators have pointed that out. Uh, that was the custom at the time. I'm not saying it's a, a good custom. I'm saying that it's, it's a bad custom. But the reality is, is this man was still making excuses. So I'm not prepared to let him off the hook. And we shouldn't be. Now what happens next is that all of these excuses are reported to the property owner, to the master who's throwing the banquet. And we need to understand that skipping out at the last minute like this was regarded as extremely disrespectful. It was downright insulting. The master had no doubt spent a large sum of money and had animals slaughtered and cooked for the occasion, so he'd understandably be very upset. Can you feel his frustration? He's prepared a wonderful party, and it was going to be wonderful, but now they were not coming. Perhaps you personally know a little bit of the sting of this. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've experienced this kind of thing personally, where you invited people to come and celebrate with you in some way and to enjoy a wonderful meal, and, and oh, I, I can't make it, I'm sorry. And you know, and you, you know how that, that sinking feeling and that dis, dis, discouragement, frustration, and you know, the, the reality of that, it can, it can sting a little bit, can't it? But let me make it a little bit worse. You know, if that happens to us, we'd say, oh, well, I have leftovers and I'll just enjoy the food, right? Well, see, that wasn't the way it was in the ancient world because there wasn't refrigeration. And so uh, in the absence of refrigeration, you slaughtered and cooked animals for a party and you needed to eat them. You couldn't say, I'll, be in, I'll enjoy those steaks for the next week. I'll put them in the freezer. No, you couldn't do that. So his response... Uh, is found in the second part of verse 21. And he tells his servant, Go quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Essentially, he's saying, Go out and invite all those who would not normally be invited. Invite people that many judged as unworthy of invitation. Invite those whose presence would be surprising to the powerful and the influential. And again, can you see the theme of generosity and care toward those who were on the margins of society. You see it right here. And can you hear how this connects with verse 13? But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And his servant responds in verse 22, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and there is still room. So what does the owner say? He says in verse 23, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Now this was a way of saying to go out and gather everyone. Find them all. And this no doubt would have included inviting Gentiles or non-Jews. Invite those who were not fellow, Jew, uh, fellow Jews. And this message would have been shocking because Jews and Gentiles don't eat together. They didn't. That was regarded as something that did not happen at that time. So the message was, go out and, and get the messy people. What was regarded as that? I'm, I'm not commending that, but this is sort of the cultural background. Can you imagine how, how shocking this would be? And remember, this is being told in the home of, of, a, of a Pharisee. <laughs> And go out and get everybody and bring them in. And Jesus makes it clear in the parable that those who were originally invited to the banquet were not going to even get a taste. They were going to be shut out for good with no opportunity to change their minds. Now, all of this leaves us asking, what does this mean? I mean, we can kind of identify with the parable, but we're trying to say, okay, why is Jesus telling this? I understand the picture, but this is a springboard to teach spiritual truth. What does it mean? That's the right question, right? 
And traditionally, this has been understood uh, to speak of the gospel going out to the Gentiles. Gentiles being, of course, non-Jews. Think about it. Uh, the Jews of Jesus' day largely, not exclusively, but largely rejected the Messiah, even though his coming was promised and prophesied in incredible detail throughout the pages of the Old Testament. In the words of John 1.11, speaking of Jesus, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. They largely, but not everyone, not everyone, but largely rejected Jesus, and the gospel has gone out for 2,000 plus years and continues to go out today to all the peoples of the world. And I'm not ethnically Jewish, so praise God that the gospel, the good news, is going out to all the peoples of the world, both Jew and Gentile. Most, notice I said not all, of those who had the promise of the Messiah, who had the prophecies, didn't receive him when he came. And this interpretation fits well with a point Jesus makes in what is known as the parable of the tenants found in Matthew 21. And this is just Matthew 21, 43. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the Jewish leaders understood that they were the tenants in the parable that Jesus told and who were being replaced, and they did not appreciate it. If you read Matthew 21, you will see that they were upset when that punchline, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. So the immediate application is Jesus' rejection and the subsequent spread of the gospel to the Gentiles, but this has lots of application for us today. Think about it. Through Jesus' death on the cross and his victorious resurrection, he says to us, to the Jew and the Gentile, all things are ready, come. To lost, sinful people, that's us, apart from Christ. We hear, all things are now ready, come. Through his finished work on the cross, all things are ready. The rescuer is here, an atonement made. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says it this way. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And this leaves us facing the question, what have I done? Or associated with that also, what will I do in response to this? Jesus says, all things are ready, come. The rescuer is here. Atonement has been made. Now is the day of salvation. What am I going to do about that? What have I done about that? Well, let's continue to consider that by considering the banquet motif a little bit more and gazing on this theme. And all of this points us uh, to the great and glorious banquet that's coming when Jesus returns. This isn't the only place in the Bible that speaks about a great banquet surrounding the coming of the kingdom of God. The feast is predicted by Isaiah in words that would have been well known to Jesus' original audience. This is Isaiah 25. But keep in mind that phrase, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. This passage that I'm about to read from Isaiah 25 would have been extremely familiar and well-known at the time. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 8. This messianic banquet expectation. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich fo food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Hear, hear the, the, the picture of this wonderful meal. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach... Of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So do you catch this banquet theme? And then do you catch connected to this banquet this glorious promise of swallowing up death forever, no more death? And, and he 
No more tears. And remember, that's coming from the prophet Isaiah hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came. And then we have here in Luke this theme of the great banquet. But then we turn to the end of the Bible, to the, actually the final chapters of the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation chapter 19, and we find the wedding supper or the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19.9. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Can you hear and see the connection with verse 15 here in Luke 14? Remember those words. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Friends, God's word is full of pictures. Looking forward to the great banquet that will occur at a point yet in the future celebrating that the kingdom of God is fully and completely realized, something that will happen upon Jesus' return. In fact, it's been rightly pointed out that the Lord's Supper itself is an, is an anticipation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, which I read every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Now, I want to pause here and consider this. You say, how, how do I apply this today? Oh, in glorious ways. Think with me here. Brothers and sisters, preach this to yourselves and to each other. Jesus is coming back. This broken, fallen world will not continue to go on as it always has. Sin, pain, and suffering do not win. This fallen world will not continue to go on as it always has. Brokenness in sin is not the end of the story. Preach to yourself and to each other, Jesus is coming back, our blessed hope. And when we gaze on that, we have an anchor in the storms of life. Are you going through hardship? Is there realities that are very difficult? For everyone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, He does not promise that in this life things will be easy. He actually says, in this world you will have trouble. But then He tells us, take heart, I have overcome the world. Don't ever forget in the storms of life that we will have storms, but we have an anchor. Brokenness doesn't win. Jesus is coming back. Now, with all of this talk about feasting, uh, think about the best meal imaginable. I don't know what your favorite one is, but uh, does, your, uh, does your mind wander to our annual in-gathering supper? If this is your uh, first, if you're in your first year of attending this church, uh, you can't wait for the Sunday before Thanksgiving. The meal is fabulous. Or is it Christmas dinner? Does your mind water, does your, does your mind wander in your mouth water as you think about it you know, the best we can imagine friends doesn't even come close to how infinitely great the great feast will be when jesus returns uh, the coming feast will be infinitely greater than anything we can imagine words are not able to fully express and fully capture how wonderful it'll be it, it it's better than we can describe but there is a surprising catch a twist in the storyline as we've seen in a lot of the parables the person with Jesus at the table who said, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God, uh, was obviously, uh, when he said that, he, he was assuming that everyone around the table was going to be at this great banquet. And Jesus' response communicates that attendance at this glorious and future banquet is anything but automatic. You see, he was talking about this like, yeah, it's going to be great. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but you want to make sure you're going to be there. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't wrong. It's going to be great. <laughs> what, are you going to be there? Let's unpack this a little bit. So we've been reminded of the coming glories of the feast, of the coming glories of heaven. And we've also been warned that not everyone will be at this wonderful feast surrounding the coming of God's kingdom. Don't reject the invitation, and don't ever lose sight of the fact that the banquet is coming. A warning and hope all wrapped around one another. 
Friends, our invitation alone doesn't, gu- doesn't guarantee our presence at the banquet. It's vitally important to understand that just as many in Jesus' original audience assumed that their invitation to the banquet guaranteed their attendance, sadly, many today assume just the same thing. It's common to assume that Jesus' invitation to us offering forgiveness and eternal life is a guarantee of those benefits. But this is a deadly mistake. If we repeat, Christ died for our sins and just blanket stop and say, have you received him? We're in danger. It's gloriously true. Christ died for our sins. But what's my response to the invitation? We must understand the invitation itself doesn't guarantee our attendance at the banquet. Through the cross and the empty tomb, through the death and resurrection of Christ, a glorious invitation, brothers and sisters, is freely offered to the world. This is the best news the world has ever known and will ever know. Probably the best known words in the entire Bible, John 3, 16 and 17, capture this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. And the Gospel is summarized well in the words of Romans 6.23, bad news and good news put together. For the wages of sin is death. And we're all sinners, brothers and sisters. We deserve for our sins death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This news is indescribably glorious, but there's a question that's staring at all of us. And the question is this, have I accepted the invitation, have I received the gift, or am I making excuses? You see, we must accept Jesus' invitation, and our acceptance isn't automatic. 1 John 1.12 says this, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. How do I become a child of God? I must receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and believe in Him. Or Romans 10.13 sums it up saying, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But do you catch the qualification? One must call upon the name of the Lord. It's not automatic. It's freely offered. It's extended. But it must be received. A personal response must be made. And this leaves us asking, Have I come to the Lord Jesus Christ in genuine faith and belief? Have I responded to God's gift? Have I received the invitation? And the answer to that question, brothers and sisters, is a matter of eternal consequence. The gift is freely offered, and it, but it must be, it must be received. The offer alone does not mean the blessings of forgiveness and eternal life are yours. And the excuses today are not all that different from the excuses we see here in what has been titled the parable of the excuses. There are excuses connected with loving material possessions more than God. And that's not far from the person who said, I have just bought a field. There are excuses centered on work uh, or career and loving our career more than Jesus. And that sounds to me like I've just bought five yoke of oxen. There are family excuses. We must love our families. Please hear me. But we're failing to love our families well when we love them more than the Lord. Let me emphatically say that. We must love our families, but you are failing to love your family well if you love them more than the Lord. And that sounds a lot to me like the man who said, I just got married. We don't love our family well when we allow them to take the place of God. All of this, all of these excuses is a package that sounds like putting the business of everyday life ahead of God and the claims of his kingdom. And it's a good application for all of us to ask, where am I making excuses in the walk of my discipleship? Perhaps you truly are a believer, but we can still struggle as believers. We still struggle with sin, this side of glory, and we still struggle with excuses. But, you know, the first question is, am I making excuses about responding to the gospel in the first place? And the second question is to say, in my life of discipleship, am I making excuses for not following the Lord as I know I should, as I know that He's calling me to. Am I saying I'll get to that later? 
So let me ask all of us, is your yes to Jesus' invitation clear? Or are you making excuses and putting off making a commitment? Think with me and remember that this parable was told in the home of a prominent Pharisee. That's a religious leader. And this reminds us that our family of origin will not save us. Being from a Christian family, having Christian parents or grandparents will not save you. Or in the case of a Pharisee, being ethnically Jewish doesn't save you either. Our family of origin will not save us. Don't reject the invitation. And friends, don't make the deadly mistake of assuming that the invitation itself is enough. We must respond and ex- to and accept it. And sometimes I think, for and I say this in quotes because I think you know what I mean, religious people, sometimes we know about the invitation, but we don't accept it. You see what I'm saying? And there's a difference. There's a difference between knowing about the gospel and being able to repeat the facts of the gospel and personally placing your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to know the facts first. That's essential, but there has to be a personal response that follows that. The facts in themselves isn't enough. It has to, we have to place our trust, our faith, our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Think with me, are you assuming that you'll have the opportunity to accept the invitation later? I've heard that said before. Don't. Brothers and sisters, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. I've been pastor long enough to have officiated funerals for people who are older than I am, much older than I am, and much younger than me as well. Some had time to prepare, others it was sudden and without warning. Don't wait. Think with me, have you ever been invited to an RSVP required event? Could be some special event with security concerns that require a controlled guest list, or it could be a special celebration where they need an accurate count. But if you fail to RSVP, you may find that on the day of the event, you are no longer welcome. And this is a picture of what we have before us today. Jesus says, come, all is ready. He says to us, through my death and resurrection, sin, death, and the devil have been conquered. Forgiveness and eternal life are freely offered through the cross, through the substitutionary atonement, Jesus dying in our place as our substitute. The gates are open to forgiveness of sins and eternal life to all who will receive him as Savior. Here's the question. Have you said yes? And if you have, praise God, we'll be seeing each other at the banquet in the kingdom. It will be glorious. Let's keep our gaze fixed in hope to the glorious future. The banquet is coming. Praise God. If you haven't received the invitation, you can confess and repent of your sin and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior right now. In your own words, acknowledge your sin and ask Him to save you. Surrender your life to His control. If you haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ and you're ready to, I'd encourage you in your own words to pray something like this, in your own words. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. At this very moment, I trust you as Savior and Lord. Make me the type of person you created me to be in Christ's name. Hear me. Don't reject the invitation. That's a very serious warning. And don't ever forget the great banquet is coming. This is news of glorious and certain hope for all believers. Let's pray.